Hey, hey, thanks for joining us on Real Talk. I'm Sharika Long O'Neill, a Colorado Girls and Geese ambassador, and one of your co hosts. I'm with Tori O'Neill, a, a Florida Girls and Geese ambassador and head of the Mighty Dames. What's up, Tori? Hey, nothing much, you know, just enjoying this lovely Florida sun. Awesome. We're here with our guest, Brenda Soto. She's a black belt extraordinaire and hands champion, I know, because she kicked my ass. <laughs> yeah. Anthony Link is a purple belt beast and a law enforcement officer. We have Erin Valentine, purple belt role model and activist. Blue Our belt. I'm a tiny person. <laughs> <laughs> Our topic today, guys, is BJJ and cop training. And we're just going to kind of get right into it. We have a lot to cover. So my first question to you guys is, should we be teaching law enforcement or should law enforcement be teaching BJJ as part of their standard training? We should um, because BJJ has more value than just a fight in itself. So I think once cops understand the value of it, that is not just the big movements and the kicks and the punch and the throws and the holes, it is beyond that. I think they can take a lot with them. Um, and one of the biggest values that I found in Jiu-Jitsu is understand how your mind and body reacts under stress. So I'm a, I'm a big, big uh, proponent that they should teach um, um, jiu-jitsu to police officers. Um, I've been training for 13 years alongside police officers, so I can see the value of what they get in. Um, in my experience, I, I'm a strong believer that it is a good art for them to learn. That's just my point, <laughs> my two cents. Two cents are important. Stephanie, what yeah. do you think? Um, I, I have a lot of different opinions on as far as if we should learn BJJ being from law enforcement. I absolutely think that it would help rather than hurt. It, it can't hurt, right? Other than the fact that we do learn chokes in BJJ, we have to be very careful not to teach chokes to law enforcement because we are not allowed to choke. And even before the George Gray thing and everything happened, my department, we've not been allowed to put our hands on somebody's neck or choke them without having to document specifically what happened. For how many years? But, sorry, what was that? For how many years were you guys uh, banned from doing? Um, it's probably been about four years that we've been allowed to do any kind of choke hold or choke takedowns. Um, we used to do carotid compression, which is basically the same as almost rear naked. We haven't been allowed to do that for years. Um, so other than the choking in BJJ, I think, um, like Brenda said, I think it's helpful. It, it teaches you. Um, how to respect other people as human beings. If you look at what happened in Minnesota, I think if this cop knew BJJ, you would naturally, because you fight the way you train, you would naturally feel that he is not moving, he's unconscious. And we all know when our partner taps or they stop moving, we freak out, we check on them, we make sure they're okay, right? Mm -hmm. So I think BJJ would help in that situation. But I also think it's important to realize that BJJ is not end all be all. Um, I'm 128 pound purple belt. And I know, um, I don't know how you black belts feel, but I know if there's a new white belt in the gym that's bigger than me, six foot or above, 200 and above, I have a hard time with them. Reason being, they're stronger and they're aggro. They don't want to lose to a female. You add in any mental disability, any drugs, alcohol, and the fact that they are fighting for their freedom because there's a good chance they're going to jail or prison, they're going to fight and they are not going to lose. So I, I don't think BJJ is end all be all, but it sure in the heck doesn't hurt to help that discipline and again being a smaller purple belt I feel like it helps me kind of equalize if somebody doesn't know how to fight so I think if you put a male in that situation it should help them a lot more than it would help me um so I I, I definitely agree with with the aspect of that jujitsu is not just one element that we need to focus on. I'm a firm believer that it's so important to be a well-rounded martial artist. I personally train, which is probably where you saw the purple belt, Sharika. I'm a purple belt in JKD concepts, which is Jeet Kune Do, which has a history of, it comes from Bruce Lee and his belief in it being a philosophy mm -hmm. of whatever you absorb, you use what's best for you. So it's a combination of Filipino martial arts, learning the works of weaponry, street fighting. Um, we cross train in Muay Thai, kickboxing. And yes, we do jujitsu, but it's not end all be all. Cause at the end of the day, while I love jujitsu and I'm a blue belt in it and I've had my 
bouts with it back and forth because you know it, it's a different type of uh, stress on the body. It's so important to know what you're going to do from stand up and how to defend yourself. Um, from the officer standpoint, I do believe that there needs to be some form of knowledge and knowing what to do in those circumstances. At the same time, I'm on the fence about it because be it someone in uniform or just a person in general, just let's, let's remove the badge for a moment. You have good and bad in all realms, you know, and I have personally seen people who want to do well and do good as a person in martial arts and they help the community. They are a light for so many. But then you have individuals, regardless of uniform or not, who aren't necessarily of sound mind, and they want to utilize something to perfect what we do, which is violent. You know, it, you can either abuse it, which I've seen firsthand. I've even heard of horrific stories of black belts, either behind closed doors, doing domestic violence towards their partner, or being abusive where I've heard told like complete stories of individuals saying, Oh my God, he rough housed me. I tapped and he still held on. You know, it's scary because what we do is technically violent. So while I believe there should be some knowledge in this, it's also scary to know that there are people who want to inflict harm. Some people just want to watch the world burn. So you don't know. And I mean, I've said this a few times to some of my friends in the past where should there or should there not be some form of psychological examination once you end up being part of something like this? Like the term is to serve and to protect. And I personally, sometimes I get nervous around officers and I'm being eyeballed. I could even be in a store just buying cereal for Christ's sakes. And I feel like I have to be extra with my phone. Like I'm putting my phone in my pocket. My hands are free, you know, because I have gotten the, hmm, what are you doing over there? It, it's nerve wracking, you know? Like sometimes I, I don't feel safe because I do worry about, okay, what if I'm the next one, you know? It's interesting. I think all of you have um, in common is you talk about the motivations that come behind the person doing jujitsu. So I think that has a lot to tie with it. Like um, we're seeing that we, we all, it seems like all three of you agree that there is some benefit of knowing at least how you will react under pressure and having that kind of control. But of course, because we are all humans, it could be used in the negative as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, believe, and I believe that's what everything that you do, right? You have the good <laughs> apple and the bad apple. And it's, I'm um, going back to your comment, Erin, it is hard for law enforcement to actually test the character of the person because once you go through a process of um, hiring process and then the academy, but then once you present it with a stressful situation, which is different because the academy is a control scenario. The street is not. That's when the right. true character comes out on top of the stress that they live day by day, on top of not sleeping well, on top of not eating well. I think over time, the character deteriorates. And I believe it's a little harder to judge that character as a, as a police department, you know, somebody in the police department. So I wish there would be the way, better ways to, to screen those kind of traits. Even I know they do their best, um, Stephanie, right? So when you get hired, you do go through a psychological background check. Um, so what our department is pushing for, what we've been trying with our wellness program is to, so when you're in a critical incident, whether it's, uh, you know, like a lot of times I'll go, not that long ago, I went on a two-year-old that was run over by her uncle. And you can see it in the officer's demeanor, their eyes, that there's something not, that they're having a hard time with this or child abuse or shooting they are required to see um, our psychologist. After every single shooting, you are required to see a psychologist so they can reevaluate the whole situation. But what we are pushing, and I'm hoping that other departments are looking at it too, is requiring our officers to go once a year. I think right now, officers don't go because the stigma, if you are seen at the psychologist, that there's something wrong with you. But you know what, we all have problems, whether it's at home, like Brenda said, it's not sleeping, it's seeing the bad in people all the time. Unfortunately, 90% of what we see is bad. We don't see the good in people anymore, so we become jaded. Um, but I think everyone has that stigma. If I go to a psychologist, everyone's gonna think that I'm broken, that there's something wrong with me. Whereas I'm hoping my department is moving towards forcing everyone to go once a year. So if you see me walking out of the psychologist's office, you don't know that, I'm having a personal problem at home, relationship, kids, or something I saw at work, you just assume it's my turn to go. So I think if every you know, department it's really does sad, that. Though, that, that's the stigma because 
I mm -hmm. feel, I mean, think about it. Even psychologists have, you know, therapy sessions. And Absolutely. it's so important to be able to express uh, what it is that you're feeling. Because sometimes, I know like you have friends that, that will probably end up saying, oh, I'm always, I'm always here for you if you need to talk to someone. But I know I personally have been like, well, they got a lot going on. Maybe I, I would be like too much for it right now. So I think it's so beneficial, like you said, that they're doing like mm -hmm. these psychological assessments. I do think that maybe it should be more than just once a year, because let's face it, you're not going to just want to express yeah. how you're feeling just once a year. Like, okay, I guess I have to bottle this all up inside until then. Right. So, and that's why they turn to alcohol. A lot of them start drinking, but, and I do agree that one, it should be more than once a year, but I think you have to start somewhere yeah. and whether the funding's yeah. not there or it is, I think going the right direction is what we should be pushing. That's a really, I'm, I'm glad to hear that um, there is departments doing that. Like you said, it's a foothold. A lot of times we want things to happen immediately and um, how we're set up as a culture just, to, it's just not, not going to hap happen like that. I'm sure there's going to people, be people resistant to going just that once a year, right. but it's a start for people who, who've been looking for a place to start. Correct. Resistance could probably come from the fact that I personally know some people that they don't feel comfortable talking about things that hurt them or bother them. Like I've had someone that I care for legit say, I don't like talking about my feelings. And when they do, they cry. And I said, well, crying isn't a weakness. Like sometimes you ever feel the weight on your world. And then when you just boo hoo it out, you just feel like this weight lifted off your shoulders and off your chest. And it's like, damn, I needed to do that a lot sooner, you know? And, and I'm a firm believer as well that if you keep sweeping things under the rug, okay, fine. You may put the dirt underneath it, but after a while, you're going to see that lump and it's going to keep building. And then after a while, it's like, damn, I just have to clean house because enough is enough. So, I, I mean, I feel like if within any relationship, if you communicate more, and you communicate your truth and what you're feeling, what you've experienced, you'd be surprised how many people you'll find in your life that it's like, I can relate to that. Absolutely. So you guys, we talked about, you know, BJJ and being able to learn techniques. Stephanie, do you also find that just because BJJ tends to be a melting pot of so many different people, personalities, upbringing, that that might have a hand in I don't know, having law enforcement understand people that they wouldn't necessarily be around. I know our gym has um, so many different people, so many mm -hmm. walks of life where we probably wouldn't have engaged if not for jujitsu. So do you think that jujitsu helps in that sense to understand the different types of people out there? And yeah, absolutely. People? Um, <laughs> you know, like I, I grew up in a poor neighborhood. I, I don't live there now. Um, so I've kind of had a great opportunity to hang out with all different sorts of people, whether it's school or work. But like you, like I said in the beginning, I think jujitsu learn with jujitsu we learn that respect for each other. Because like you said, there are some people in our gym that are walking in with ankle bracelets, and then you have other people that are FBI or police officers, and you don't look at them as criminal cop or you know poor not poor or CEO Wendy's worker. You look at everyone as your partner. So like I said in the beginning, I think learning that discipline so much as when you feel somebody going unconscious, you feel your partner tapping, you feel something wrong, you immediately stop and you check on your partner. And what's the first thing we all do? We all apologize and say, are you okay? We're not worried about anything else, but are you okay? Because we want you as a person to be okay and come back. So I do think that helps learn that discipline, but we also, for me, it helps personalize everyone and see everyone as a person. And much like Erin was saying, um, Shrika knows just as much. And I don't know if it's just how I grew up, if it's my job, I don't know what it is, but I was that person that kept everything inside. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I don't want anyone to know my personal life. I don't want you to know anything about me. And jujitsu has opened up a different world for me with female friends, with male friends. And I'm more comfortable at my gym talking to everyone than I am at work now talking to everyone, just because everyone there, like Aaron said, they've been through certain situations. They've seen it, they've done it. And I don't feel judgment when I'm inside my gym. That makes sense. So we also talked about Colorado has banned chokeholds for about four years, you said. Do you, do you guys think that they should be banned in all the states? I don't know if it's Colorado. I'm, I don't know. I just know my department. I don't know all okay. of Colorado's policies. Well, I know it's been banned in New York um, recently. Okay. Um, yeah, I've seen a lot of recent ones, Aaron. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I can see why there would be a ban because most of the time, 
Not many know really what they're doing. They just think, okay, if I keep them restrained, they won't move. And the problem is like, there's some people like, okay, I know I have brute force and I want to hurt this person because they're doing wrong. But then you sometimes have the people that don't really know the sensitivity in this specific area. It doesn't take much. Like we've seen in competition, how people can literally go to sleep that even the person that's being choked doesn't really realize like, okay, I'm just going to try and fight this out. And all of a sudden they're knocked out, you know? So it's like, it doesn't really take too much. So I feel like if these chokes are not going to be banned, then they need to be educated in a certain way. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I feel like there's so much road ahead for someone to learn what those do's and don'ts are. I mean, I've been training jujitsu for six years now, and I still feel like a white belt at times because there's so much to learn. But I mean, I, I mean, it's like I said, I'm still at the 50-50 with that because there's just some people who do want to hurt someone. And I just want to add to what Aaron said about um, that banning them for 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 well for good, but they people need to understand them. I think the understanding of the choke is very important because a lot of cops that don't have training, either just regular people, and they come to jujitsu for the first time, they just squeeze your neck. And mm -hmm. if you never teach them, don't squeeze the neck. There's more that you can do. They're gonna do it. And I have trained with police officers that they're new to the academy, and they they come and they squeeze my neck, but they don't know. They have no idea what they do, and they don't try to shock me. But they go into panic mode. And the first, mm -hmm. if you just watch the white belts, the, well, the first thing that they do is they come and they engage their head. So I think they should educate people. And the more educated you are, the more better choices you're gonna make. So I think they should not ban them. I think they should actually practice them and teach them when it's a hold and when it's a, a choking hold or when it's used just to restrain because it, it seems to nature. It's in the natural nature of, you just wanna go for the head and squeeze that head, the neck. So I think more education, more practice and that. In order to be calm when you're doing a choke, it, you have to do it and do it and do it and do it and be calm about it. And then you understand when a choke is there. For example, for the black belts, you know when you get it. Even though you're not finished it, you know it's there and you just release. So I think um, training and practice will be important instead of just saying, no, there's something forbidden. You should not go there. That is just my opinion on, on those choke holes. Um, just real quick though. I I think you made a good point there, Brenda, is I think if people in fights, including officers, fights look bad, right? No matter what we do, fights look bad. You watch UFC and it looks bad. You have professional fighters that fight only, only fight for a living. And even though your opponent's knocked out, you keep fighting until the ref says stop because they can get back up. And what happens if they get back up, you might lose that fight, right? So I think it's important to remember all fights look bad um, and there's not a ref when it comes to a street fight, whether it's a police officer or two people fighting, there's no referee to say stop, it went too far. Um, so I think Brendan made a point with if people train and they learn, then you're more comfortable in those situations. So if you know, you're know you holding somebody in side control, you're not freaking out, trying to knee them, trying to hit them because you're comfortable in your abilities. But we also learn our... Uh, you know, where we can and cannot get away with stuff. Cause I, I know my limits because of jujitsu. I know, you know, looking at Sharika, she's my size, but I also know that she could whip my ass. Right. So I think it's <laughs> important. <to> know. <laughs> I'll, I'll admit that. Um, but you know, but I think it's knowing my limits. It's looking, you know, some guys might look at all of us women and think that we're an easy target, right? But we're not because we're gonna fight. So I think it's important, like Brenda said, is being comfortable in those situations where maybe you are losing, maybe you're winning, and you don't need to keep fighting. Yeah. And I want to ask. There's so many other forward. things too oh. in jujitsu that's not just a chokehold. There's so, like uh, wrist lock. Like, like I said, um, even side like control. Why right? are those not really the go-to things? Like you can do so yeah. much damage to a wrist or just hyperextending someone's, you know, joint. Like why is the choke always the go-to though? It's not. I think it's it's human like, nature. Yeah, I think it's human nature. I think it's the easy one. It's if you don't learn, you know, if you don't know jujitsu, what else do you do? I just want to add a, and you punch. I'm sorry. I just want to add something that you said. Number one, yes, fights don't look good, but they must. Sometimes you have to go hands on on a person to arrest them because you're doing your job. And going about training jujitsu again, I want to share a quick story with you guys. Me being as a purple belt, and the omoplata is one of my kind of natural transitions. And as a purple belt, I know that once you strip somebody in the omoplata, you shouldn't, you know, come on top with a bicep slicer. But when you, if you don't practice and practice and practice, if you do that sweep and you come out with a bicep slicer, you can hurt your partner. And 
you, you know, sure enough, I went to a tournament and I did that unconsciously. And then, but I realized, so you know what? I, I didn't hurt the lady because I realized a little bit sure before ripping her bicep out of the bone. But then I realized, you know what? I need to go back to my academy and be comfortable, make this position familiar for me. So when I find myself there again, I'm, I'm conscious about it and I can protect my partner. So yes, it's, it's making familiar, the unfamiliar familiar. How do I react under stress? I have so a question. Brenda and Stephanie, oh, sorry, go ahead, Tori. Oh, good. I had a question about that. So we're all thinking of that. Um, I think we, we have a general consensus that jujitsu is definitely beneficial. Um, I see, Brenda, you say you would like, you don't want them to stop it. You want them to train a little more. My, my um, question is, do we postpone them then while that training takes place? Because, you know, it does take a while to get comfortable with it. And would you still want people to, you know, have the authority to execute these chokes without proper knowledge? Or do we kind of, you know, in a perfect world, are we still waiting for people to actually start their training? Because we've all had that one white belt who you've taught them a move one time and they are convinced they have it. And next thing you know, someone has a broken finger or something like that. Yes. Um, That's the other thing too with jujitsu is that you like, yeah, we all learn the same concepts like rear naked choke, arm bar, omoplata, guard, but everyone has their own martial art. Everyone has their own like go-to, like what maybe one person's arm bar go-to maybe like not really useful for someone else. So everyone's like jujitsu is completely different. Like I'm more of a top player. Whereas somebody else, their guard can be like, you know, as sharp as a sword. It's like, oh my God, like you're in and out, you're doing all these crazy things. So it's like, what would also be beneficial for them to learn that everyone can actually really be good at? Yeah. Um, and, and going back to Tori, I think um, I thought about that too, because our academy mm -hmm. is six months, right? And I'm like, well, how do you teach somebody jujitsu in six months? But yeah. I got my blue belt in eight months. Um, in the academy, we worked out every single day. We ran every single day. We did CrossFit every single day. But you're not required to pass a single physical agility test ever, which I think is a problem. I think, um, you know, if firefighters can still be tested every single year to make sure they're physically fit, then police should, because I think that would help the confidence and the ability. If you're not even confident in yourself because you're overweight and you're not fit, mm -hmm. well, now we have a problem because what's next? Weapons, right? If I'm not confident going hands-on, I'm probably going to chase somebody pepper ball or use some kind of weapon, whether it's a baton. So I think that's a huge thing. But I also think if you teach somebody jujitsu five days a week, every single day, instead of running and doing CrossFit, why couldn't they be close to a blue belt? I agree with you. I, agree I, with you I didn't know they didn't have to keep doing fitness training. Again, you don't, I, my, you don't my, even have to pass it in the academy. Like we don't what? have to pass it. What? We don't have to pass in the academy. We don't have to actually do the run, push up, sit ups, and what? we don't get tested. What? Wait, is that hold just on. specific <laughs> to yours? Stand by. Like, so, so, uh, oh my God. Okay, so husband, agility, uh, <laughs> having I, some sort of physical like ability to do these things. Like, let's face it. Okay, some criminals you're gonna have to run after. You're not always gonna have a car around. You know, yeah. you're something's gonna have to do this thing on foot. So it's weird because before, <laughs> just before Tori started talking, I was actually going to ask both Brenda and Stephanie, what self-defense things do they do for officers, you know, before mm -hmm. testing for the academy? And, mm -hmm. you know, what do they instill while you're an officer? Like, right. but and now so you just I, said that. Now I'm thinking, yeah. oh, nothing. <laughs> and, uh, I, so I'm <laughs> and part of the problem, right? So you guys are yeah. seeing part of the problem that I've had for years but what can I do? It's American Disability Act. There's nothing they can do, which I still don't understand because if the fire department has a yearly test, mm -hmm. why couldn't we? Because it's part of your job. Like Erin uh, just said, you have to run after someone, you have to detain them. But um, I could say for my department, we are not required to pass it ever. We don't have to do it and we don't have a yearly. Um, in the academy, we do, we learn some ground fighting like Krav Maga. I don't know if any of you guys have ever done Krav Maga. Well, I don't personally train in the Krav yeah. Maga art itself, but yeah, uh, um, doesn't it doesn't it stem from um, uh, Israeli combat fighting? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, and it's great, but much like jujitsu, if you're not training it every day and you're doing gun takeaways and knife takeaways every day, I don't remember it. So I, I couldn't even tell you what Krav Maga looks like other than pushing the gun out of your face. Um, 
what else we do? We Even do that some, takes a lot of practice. It does. It does. And you're going to get shot. But, um, and, and I take away, just, you're probably going to get stabbed. Um, but as far as like arrest control, we do some and we do once a year, but since the budgets have started to decrease over years, especially now, most of our arrest control is done online, not in person. So, so what it goes way? back to that whole thing of <laughs> out being you. better training. <laughs> Yes. Right. And so when people talk about defunding police, so let's be real. The reality of defunding police is not getting rid of police, right? It means mm -hmm. cutting our budget. Where does that budget come from? It means less training, less um, time learning how to drive, shoot, arrest control, and any physical agility tests. So is that really the direction we want to go? Maybe. But if we're talking about learning jujitsu, we're talking about being more physically fit, being a, being, you know, in an environment where you're comfortable and you're able to actually get in somebody and get on side control without having to knee them in the face or choke them because I actually know how to handle this situation until my cover gets here. Well, if we're taking away training, aren't we kind of doing the opposite of what we're wanting to do? I mean, I'm kind of confused though, because it's like if they don't do agility tests and you don't have to pass those physical examinations, what's the funding for training going to then? Like what exact training other than, you know, learning how to shoot a gun properly, what right. other and training? <coughs> we have a lot of training. Um, we have like critical incident training. Um, we have how to handle mental disabilities and mental disorders and um, people that are on drugs. We have Narcan training, CPR training, um, how to interview training, how to drive training. So, I mean, we are constantly training, but we're only required to do 24 hours. Anything above that is on your own. For my specific unit, it's, learning how to be an engineer. So we're constantly training on how to reconstruct using physics. So there's tons of training, but a lot of it is really on you to do. So wow. it seems like there's a lot of individualized studies, like you can go, but it seems like it's very introduction and there's doesn't seem to be very much beyond the like 101 courses. I, I tend to feel that way. Um, yeah. I guess I could be wrong, but I feel like I'm not. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because I mean, I work there, but I, I yes, I agree. I, I feel like the the main, like you said, the one on one training is there. Here's the basics. But as far as going above and beyond and learning how to actually, like, great, we all know how to look at someone and say it's excited delirium. But what do we do with that? Uh, I mean, what do we honestly do? We all know how to do CPR, and that's great. And we all know how to put tourniquets on and put blood clots on you. But are we actually doing it? And that's the real thing is I went to combat CPR, but that was because I signed up for it, not because they forced me to do it. So if people aren't signing up to do it, are they learning it? Wow. Very good question. Um, it, it's, it's interesting because you look at the, the lack of training we have in certain aspects and then you wonder why we keep having problems. Wow. Yeah. That, um, so let's go ahead and go to the next question. We're seeing now, especially with everything that happened, we're seeing this, um, it's funny because Black Lives Matter is not new. It's been around for about, what, six, seven years now, but you're really seeing it become more prominent. And now it's almost created this Black Lives Matter versus Blue Lives Matter movement that's going on. And I was wondering, should it be such a, you know, them versus us or um, Black or white issue? And is it possible to be both Black and Blue Lives Matter or, you know, supporting police officers and African-Americans? Sounds crazy. You do remember, even and you it. also have, but you also have African Americans that are police officers. Exactly. So do you have to choose? Like, well, see, can't, I, can't, both of my parents are police officers, so I think it's hilarious that it's an is either or. But and how do they feel about it? Are you allowed, are you allowed to tell us? Oh no, I'm I'm fine with that. Well, they're about they're both retired. I say let me let me rephrase this. My father was a police officer in Orlando for about twenty years, and then my mother was a corrections officer in Orlando for about twenty five years. Can I say that? That sounds right. My father's a little bit more on the conservative side. So while he understands the Black Lives Matter, he's, um, you know, we, we come from a, a, a military and uh, police background that's a little bit more authoritarian, you know, follow the rules. But even they are like, okay, no, stuff's getting crazy. And then, you know, my mother, she's been out in the street protesting with us with the Black Lives Matter. Um, it's, from my personal belief, I believe, um, I, um, I believe you can say Black Lives Matter and be a police officer, it shouldn't be controversial. I think you should be able to be a Black person and say you, um, that you support the police officer or that you don't have, um, 
that you don't have an issue with the individual police officers. I feel, feel like we, we're, um, the large grouping is what's, it's kind of what's killing us. But at the same time, that's kind of like the only way we know how to categorize people is the, in their grouping. It was beautiful what you said, but yeah, I, I agree that, <laughs> of course, I'm pro Black Lives Matter too, but I think it, it shouldn't be a division. It's not us versus them, them versus, versus us. It is a problem, and we need to fix the problem. You, the, Even the, the problem, same thing with racism. Racism isn't just black and white. I've seen people, like other people of color, mm -hmm. say like asinine things. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, have you looked in the mirror? Uh, I'm, I'm just like, or like, I've even had, like, I'm Puerto Rican. So there are three different like ethnicities that are in the Puerto Rican culture. And one of them being African-American. I've seen some posts from a couple of people that I know. And I had to like, kind of like slide into their DM and say, you do know <laughs> that there are three things in there, right? And it's like, they just went right over their head. It's like, I, I think it's so important to know your history as well. Yeah, and I agree. Um, I know from my standpoint, I have family um, that are mixed. We have a lot of uh, African American in our family. And, you know, even with my son, him and his friends want to go down and protest. And I 100% agree with their right and their ability to protest peacefully, um, respectfully, without causing more harm than good. Um, but I, I think it shouldn't be a division. I think if there's a way for the minority cops or even white cops that absolutely agree that black lives matter and that things need to be changed, if they can all be on the same page, it makes things easier. But, I, and like you said, it's easy to group people, right? Cause you look at all looters are the same. All looters are protests. All police are bad. Not all police are bad. Um, some are absolutely. Yeah. But I think you also have the ones that came on the job to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And it's hard because can't protest cause I want to keep my job but I also want to see change too. And I don't know how to make those changes if everyone's so divided. I think somehow they have to figure out how to come together to make those changes and but to understand why, all why sides. Is, why is it so polarizing, do you guys think? I think if somebody says, oh, Black Lives Matter, it's like, oh, well, White Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter. Yes, yeah. we get that. The problem and there have, for some reason, they're seeing it as only Black Lives Matter. It's like, no, it's mm -hmm. not only. It's Black Lives Matter in the aspect of they're the ones still being oppressed. Mm -hmm. Well, it's I think like, also there's you a little can't bit, even go jogging for Christ's sakes without someone coming for you. I think but also I there's think a little bit of a confusion of the phrasing mm -hmm. is um, people take the Black Lives Matter and they're applying it to all walks, all, all stages of life. But what we're saying is Black Lives Matter is, is like specifically talking about police brutality and institutional racism. We're not, you know, jumping in a, um, jumping at a, at a library and pushing, you know, the elderly white woman aside. It's like, whoa, 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 Black Lives Matter, I'm first. <laughs> I think we, we, we're, I think we're taking the phrasing out of what its original intent is because it's gotten so much more popular. Mm -hmm. And remember that the phrase only existed because of the killings of African American and other black and brown people. I think it's getting I think it's getting it's getting skewed very much so. Maybe we right. need to put like comma two on there to stop <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, because I, I think um uh, police brutality has been around for years, right? Everyone knows that it, it's been around and I think um a lot of that goes back to comfort training knowledge. But I, I don't I don't know why people take that as such a only only our lives matter, not everyone else's lives matter when I feel like at a certain point, even, you know, cops have to realize things have to change and they are changing. Um, everything's on video now. So what you do and how you talk to people changes. No different than if, you know, you and I are talking on the street, we're not going to sit there and disrespect each other and get in a fight because why would you do that? So I think that mutual respect has to be on all sides. And I, I don't know why Black Lives Matter has become such a racial thing and only Black Lives Matter. And I, you're right, it becomes a, well, so do white lives. Like, great no one thing in your life doesn't matter but i wonder if people don't realize that racism still exists i know every single one of us has gone to a store or a car dealership or something and experienced some sort of racism right i live so in I the south so i'm just gonna leave that as it is oh, no. <laughs> so no yeah, we're, we're cool not. down here yeah super inclusive right <laughs> 
I actually saw something not too long ago that said, for those of you that keep saying all lives matter in response to Black Lives Matter, do you even like remotely hear what you're saying? Do you see what you're writing? Do you ever tell someone, well, all cancers matter if they do a breast walk, a uh, breast cancer walk? It's like, no, you don't. You show your support. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like, okay, yeah. Every, if anyone that's had cancer, it's like, of course, you matter, regardless of whatever cancer you had. But if you're literally making a point to just say, hey, look, this needs a little more acknowledgement because <laughs> of X, Y, and Z, it, you know, I, it's just, it's baffling to me, like to even see all lives matter or how they're painting over the murals that say Black Lives Matter. I, I just it's. Can I just say about the murals? Is I find it very hilarious that they're painting over letters with another color and it's still <laughs> visible. Like they're painting over the yellow, but they're using that. like black or white paint, <laughs> so you can still see the Black Lives Matter. It's just a different color. I have not seen that. Oh, it's hilarious. Please, please. It's hilarious to see it. <laughs> That's just the bottom line. I mean, the reality is, is we all know all lives matter, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it really starts hitting home when you have kids that are of color and you start worrying about your kids. But I don't just worry about my son um, from police officers. I worry about him being targeted because of his skin color, because he's dark. Is somebody going to not like him because he's dark skin? Is he going to be pulled over because of that? I mean, I'm not just worried about law enforcement so far as everything right now, everything with mm -hmm. race right now. We, we've all seen on YouTube where, you know, white people are being attacked for their skin color, black people are being attacked for their skin color. So then when you start thinking about your kids and your loved ones and innocent kids that are young still, it's like, well, damn, I don't want you to go outside and I want you to keep your you know, but inside where I can see you and protect you because right now it's just, it's a scary world out there from all aspects of life right now. That's true. Okay, so since we all are, you know, we're all within this jujitsu community, you know, do we think that jujitsu could become a place of understanding that like we could, because I think most of us would agree that we do see a fair amount of law enforcement within our community. Um, could this be like a place where we could start building, you know, some of that, um, some of that mutual respect and understanding? So like you said before, Stephanie, when you have people who come in, you know, some people can be cops, some can be coming in with an ankle monitors, but we starting to understand this mutual respect. Is that something that we could do like more wide scale? I think so. But again, I go back to the, you got to remember if, if police officers start getting jaded, right? So then who do you hang out with only? You only hang out with other police officers. No different than like nurses hang out with just nurses. Mm -hmm. But when you're hanging out with just law enforcement, and you're all jaded. Where do you see the good in people if that's all you see? So I think jujitsu opens your eyes back up to that. I mean, I get, I actually get teased all the time by other officers because while we're driving, I'll have homeless people wave to me and I'm waving like the excited wave and I'm talking to everyone and people like, you have to stop and talk to everyone. I'm like, but why wouldn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't I wave at them if they wave at me? Why wouldn't I talk to them if they talk to me? You know, and I, I might go over the top and do the stupid little like overexcited wave just because they think it's funny. But, you know, mm -hmm. I get in my police car and I put on music and I dance and I, I want to have fun. But I think if we don't see the good in people, then where do you see it? And I think jujitsu is a great place to learn that respect. Because if you don't respect them, you get your ass kicked. That's <laughs> what I'm trying to say that. You go to different walks of life and you're, you're walking yeah. in a car with a different mentality from a different world culture and being exposed to other cultures in a, in a sense of in-home cultures, right? To all the people that do different jobs, it, it humbles you. It humbles you because you're coming in saying, I'm the alpha male. And then there's this, you know, little girl that weighs 130 pounds that has a desk job. And then it teaches you something different in life. And it's just humbling. Absolutely. And I don't know about you ladies. definitely big in jujitsu. You'll get humbled real quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know about you ladies that live in other states. I know um, here in Colorado, we used to bus for diversity. So you would bus to different schools. So, you know, like all of us kids from the ghetto got shipped out to the prominently white schools. But then that gives yeah. us an opportunity to hang out with different walks of lives as it does them for us, right? Because you get to meet us and see that we are people. Yes, we're not wearing name brand clothes and we're not driving around in Porsches and BMWs, but we're still people and they learn to respect us. But we don't have that in Colorado anymore. It's choice school. So you don't bust and there's no diversity like it used to be. So I don't, I think if there's no diversity growing up and you never get to learn and see other cultures, I think that jujitsu is a great place to learn that. But where else would you learn it? Do you guys have diversity in your 
States because we have none here. My yeah, son went to a yeah. Again, I I say I'm in the South. So it's endless diversity here. <laughs> oh, you do have it. I'm in Arizona and uh, we used to have it. We had it for about 30 years and then it was removed about like 20, 20 years ago. So about the same as us. Cause my son yeah. went to a predominantly white school. I think he was one of five minorities at his school. That's not good. <laughs> you know, and it's to the point where everybody's asking every day what race he is. Cause they can't figure out what race he is. Like, come on. I will say that I keep saying because I'm in the South, but I'm in Florida, which is a very, very weird Southern state where we can be very country in one <laughs> space. And then you drive like, half an hour and you're in the city so um there are pretty diverse blended places but if we talk about you know there's diversity but how do we get that diversity into the jujitsu community because even in my area i'm one of i'm the only black person in my gym consistently i'll take that back aiden's back here now um yeah see so we're not yeah. we have we have the police officers we have the military people there but do we have I don't want to like exclude Brazilians, but like non-Brazilian, you know, people of color coming into those, into the gym, because it's not a part of our culture. And if not, how do we get that outreach to get them? Because like you said, that is a great place for, you know, African-American, especially African-American youth to get a more playful, a more, um, a different, res a different understanding of police officers be be um, besides just their badge, but they're not really coming into to into play with them. It's something, to look that, into, right. it's something to look into your gym. What is it? What is lacking that is not attracting, hmm. you know, that the um, population that you, you want to attract. So it's actually it goes back to the um, to the gym owners and say, what am I doing that I'm not being attractive to this to this community? And perhaps maybe be putting a gym in that community. Somebody open a gym hmm. to closer to a community where there's more African Americans. For example, here in Arizona, um, I live in the northwest side. It's a mixed, mixed uh, part of town. But one of our students opened an academy right in the south side, where there's a lot of Mexicans. So now the uh, you know jujitsu has been exposed to more Mexican, more Hispanic community, and that's all that it needed. It took somebody to be in that area and open an academy for it to to show it and, and to be to expose that population, that community into what jujitsu was. And now we cross cross train. They come over, we go over. And then I, I think that's my, maybe something that your academies can look into it. If it's possible, of course. They've been, definitely we're seeing exposure would, would help there. And um, again, coming from the African-American community, I think that um, when it comes to combat sports, cause I mean, jujitsu is a combat sport it's typically like boxing or bust. All the other ones are kind of still a mystery, but I think as you get sports like um, MMA growing, you see people more willing to transition. Like I, I'm seeing kids get into wrestling more and stuff like that. So maybe that, as that continues to grow, we'll see more people get into the jujitsu scope. And that's a good point that you raised because jujitsu is fairly new. I mean, it's been in the U.S. for like, what, 20, 25 years? And boxing has been in the U.S. for a lot longer than that football you know all those u.s uh sports so it might take a little longer but it, it is possible I yeah gotta... why do you think our gym is not more diverse do you think it's location i think it is where we live i mean there's just a handful of black people they certainly let me know that i'm not welcome um and our gym is just maybe five to ten minutes away it's a absolutely welcoming gym, but there's just not a lot of me there's not a lot of stuff in this area but we have one in denver too and there's not very many minorities down there i don't think that's true it's probably our fault. <laughs> well we can definitely say that mm. we can see that this is a avenue that we could explore later is we could think of ways to if not open a gym perhaps do more outreach in those communities you know we can always drag um some mats down to a park and teach some kids if yeah. only once a weekend but um yeah, this has been great, ladies. Thank you all for coming in today. Um, I'm glad that we were able, like you said we from the beginning, we were able to have a good conversation um, with different, we have all have a little bit different views without it go, turning into a screaming match, without any of us you know, losing our dignity, because I, I feel like people don't care about that anymore. But um, thank you all. I think we this was a really helpful conversation. I hope that it encourages more people to, um, you know, talk to some people and express different ideas and see what you can gain from each other. 
Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you ladies Thank you. so much. We appreciate you guys taking time out of your day. This is a really relevant topic and I think it's something to, to start the conversations amongst our different areas. So thank you.